Hello everyone, I'm Matthew Taylor, the Chief Executive of the RSA, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this very special event, Creativity Matters, an RSA fellowship tribute to Sir Ken Robinson. We wanted to draw this extraordinary year to a close by paying our society's respects to Sir Ken, whose loss this year was so deeply felt by so many. Ken was an inspiration to RSA fellows worldwide and a guiding influence in the RSA's work over the years. That influence was recognized with the award of the RSA's Benjamin Franklin Medal in 2008. And on the evening he accepted that award, he gave one of his legendary talks from the Great Room stage. And the resulting RSA Animate, Changing Education Paradigms, went on to have truly global reach and life-changing impact. Ken influenced me personally in many ways, but there's one specific bit of symmetry I want to share with you really, which is that just after I became chief executive of the RSA, my mother told me I should watch Ken's TED talk. And I did, and like so many other people, I was thrilled by it. And it made me realize the immense potential of the RSA events program. And we went on from that to grow our program, to be more ambitious in the way that we could spread ideas and to film our events and then to animate our events. And as I've said, Ken's animate was one of the most powerful um, of all. So really what the RSA does, the way we try to get ideas out to the world was influenced by Ken and now of course, we're much better than Ted. So Ken has really influenced the RSA over and beyond, of course, the incredible power of his ideas on education and creativity. So tonight we're gonna to hear reflections on Sir Ken's life's work and legacy from a fantastic lineup of speakers and performers. But before we begin, I wanted to thank Dr. Penny Hay for all she's done to make this special gathering possible and for hosting for us this evening. And with that, thank you, Penny, and over to you. Thank you, Matthew. Um, I'm delighted to be here. So um, yes, I'm Penny Hay. I'm a reader in creative teaching and learning at Bowsby University and research fellow in the Center for Cultural and Creative Industries. I'm also a director of research for a charity that used to be called Five by Five, and Ken used to tease me about that, and now it's called House of Imagination in his honour. So, Sir Ken was a dear friend. We met in 1989, and I worked with him in the 90s, and all through, he was a patron of our charity for 20 years. Ken was such, such a wonderful and wise human being always full of humour and kindness. His passion for creativity and his belief in children and young people's creative potential has inspired millions and changed lives across the world. Ken's extraordinary legacy will live on and we will be sure of that. So with this in mind, it's my pleasure to introduce Kate Robinson, Ken's daughter. Welcome, Kate. Thank you so much, Penny, uh, for that introduction. Thank you, Matthew, and um, thank you to the RSA for organising and hosting uh, this beautiful tribute to my dad. Um, I'd also like to thank everybody, actually, who's speaking this evening, who um, everyone you're about to hear from knew dad, worked with him, um, and he had so much respect for the work that they were all doing um, many times together and with him. Um, you know, we aren't here today because he died so much we're here because he lived and because he lived we are different and the world is different he changed the lives of so many people as Matthew said he changed the way that we thought he validated the way that we felt for many people he let them know that it wasn't that there was something wrong with them it was there was something wrong with the system that maybe didn't get them or wasn't designed or by the way it was designed couldn't accommodate who they were he empowered parents to take a lead in their children's education. He empowered educators to be the change that they wish to see within a system. And 
he was a voice of reason and a, a friendly voice through so much of the chaos, essentially with what was a simple message, which was what if we did things differently? And if we did things differently, how many more people would flourish and would be better off for it? I've often been asked what he was like in person, and I think everybody here can attest to what I'm about to say. If you saw his TED talk or you saw his RSA animate talk or any or, or read his books, you know what he was like in person because the person on stage wasn't a carefully curated alter ego. It was who he was to his core. And I think that's such an incredible accomplishment of his. He was sincere. He never changed who he was or changed his message or sold out to, to move forward. He everything he did came from a place of absolute sincerity and at the core of his work was really a celebration of human potential of our potential as a species and our potential individually. He often said that we don't live in the world as other creatures do. We create the worlds in which we live and we do this through our incredible power of imagination. He defined imagination as the ability to bring to mind things that weren't present. And as far as we know, we humans are unique in, in this ability of imagination. Um, he also defined creativity as applied imaginations, taking the things that we imagine and making them a reality. And it's because of, it's because of this power of imagination that everything we know and rely on and depend on and take for granted exists. Everything from our systems of democracy to our works of art, to our language, to our vibrant cities, to the fact that we're here joining and having this conversation digitally came from a spark of imagination and imagine if moment imagine if this was possible imagine if we did this i'm lucky enough over the past several years to have worked closely with him and um he had a very brief illness um his, his death was a shock to i think to everybody and, and to us as his family certainly but when we found out that he was dying, I made a promise to him that I would dedicate my life to continuing his work, which is something I was doing anyway. Um, he's just left me with rather a lot more autonomy than I was expecting at this point. But in our conversations and how best to carry on his legacy, well, two things. One, I'm acutely aware that it's not my job or any of our job to build him a legacy, that he did that himself through, um, through his incredible career and the work that he accomplished while he was alive. So my first note is that if I am involved in his legacy, I have a responsibility not to mess it up. But in, in deciding how best to do it, we were really inspired by a talk that he gave in May as part of the call to unite, during which he said that thanks to the pandemic, we've hit pause on our social systems and it's time to hit reset on them as well. He felt it was important that we didn't race back to normal, that, that we took this opportunity of a global pause to reset our values and where we were. He often talked about education is being a human system. And so many of the systems, all of the systems that we know were hum human systems, which means that as we created and designed them, it's within our power to redesign them. So inspired by that and inspired by his passionate advocacy for imagination, we're starting a provocation, imagine if, um, imagine if we did things differently. Imagine if we didn't group children by age in school, imagine if every child was valued by the system, imagine if every adult had access to his or her passions, every ad 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 lived his or her element to the core. Um, this evening, we're joined by an incredible panel of people and I'm excited is the wrong term. Um, frankly, I wish, you know, I wish we weren't doing this this evening, or I wish that we were doing it with him. But as we are here and where we are, and we'll talk a bit about his legacy throughout the evening, um, I am excited by the work that he has left us to do. And he would be the first to say that it's bigger than he was. It, 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 he, he sparked something or he joined a series of sparks. He would also be the first to say that he wasn't the first to say it. Um, but we have a role if we were touched by him, if he lit a spark in us to fan the flames, that spark and to carry his light forward. So I'm excited this evening to be putting forward the Imagine If provocation to everybody who's about to speak and um, to learn from them and to hear from them. Imagine if we did things differently. Penny, I'll pass back to you to, to uh, introduce Sue. Thank you so much, Kate. That was really, really beautiful. And as I said, your dad would be so, so proud of you. So it's my pleasure now to introduce to you um, our Vice-Chancellor from Bath Spa University, 
Professor Sue Rigby and Peter Clegg, um, founding director of Field and Clegg Bradley Studios. Over to you. Thanks, Benny, and uh, thank you very much, Kate, for that introduction. Uh, Peter and I have a, a very concrete, or as it will turn out, a very kind of middle Jurassic limestone suggestion uh, <laughs> for a memorial for, for Sir Ken. Um, so Peter's going to set the scene and then I'm going to give that provocation of Imagine If. Yes, thanks very much, Sue. Uh, uh, I, I'd just like to start by saying I, I have a, a couple of things that I share with Ken. One is that I, I was born in in August 1950, just like him, I realized the other, the other day. And the other thing is that uh, I make the link between uh, West Breton, um, Breton College of Higher Education and Bath Spa University, both of which were centers of creative education when they were founded in the post-war era. And one of the things I'd like to talk to Sue about is the role of, the, of uh, colleges of art, colleges of education in bringing creativity to cities. I think we have tremendous opportunities here. I, I heard Ken talk uh, at Bath Spa about five years ago when Penny invited him down. And Penny, as you know, is, uh, has, has been host to Forest of Imagination, the House of Imagination, everything to do with imagination in the city. And we have this extraordinary opportunity now to bring the House of Imagination into the center of the city with a, a park that has been unused for many years really, and could become an extraordinary place where art and landscape and art education meet together. And we're tremendously excited by this possibility. But I think from your point of view, uh, Sue, I've always thought that Bath Spa was uh, a real catalyst for change within the city. I came here 40 years ago, and it was a tremendous place because it had a new university on the hill and it had Bath Spa just beginning to find its feet as a college of education, college of art. And the two together made the creative city for me. And, uh, you know, I just like to encourage you to talk a little bit about the, uh, the your outreach within the city and the importance of the city to, to, the, to, to the college of education, which is obviously on the edge, but you, you have got new campuses in the city as well that are really working in terms of crystallizing creativity in, in the centre. Thanks, Peter. Yeah, I mean, Bath is, is very special, isn't it? Because if you go back into the Regency period, it was created by four architectural geniuses with yeah. the imagination to, to make it up. And back in the 60s, it reinvented itself by employing the imaginative energy of the 1960s to develop a completely new way of being. And as we recover from the COVID pandemic and we look forward, I would love it if Bath Spa University and Bath University and all of the other elements of the city and the great schools that it, it uh, holds, but particularly all of its children and its adults were able to live in that sense of being creative and employing their imaginations to the common wheel and, and I think what, what you and I would like to to suggest as our provocation tonight is something along the lines of imagine if Bath were designated the city of imagination in, in Ken's honour so that we could harness all those energies again under that banner um, and, and really reset the clock so that instead of perhaps looking backward we take all of that energy and focus it forward so that the young people who are growing up now have the confidence and the vitality to make the absolute best of their lives that they, they possibly can. Absolutely. A city of imagination with two great universities and a whole load of schools that Penny has begin, is, infiltrates every year with excitement and creativity. And the, those schools and those amazing art teachers need support and they need colleges and universities to actually feed downwards to, to, the, to, to the children in those schools. And, uh, you know, what better place than Bath to actually establish itself as a city of imagination? So, so really, that, that's our starting point. Um, we've got the blessing, albeit it doesn't cost anything, of, of the mayor and the leader of the city council and the local MP and the two universities. Um, 
we've got permissions to do things that that we might not have imagined we were going to do a year or so ago uh, and to do it rather quicker than we we would have wished um we think that this is not just an imaginative leap but a challenge and we hope very much a creative challenge um starting in bath but really leaking out in all sorts of unexpected ways right across the uk and beyond to say can we do better can we bring our children up in a creative environment? Can we give them confidence in their own skills and, and attributes? Can we make them believe they are capable of changing the world so that when they come to university, they do it bravely, innovatively, outstandingly? And when they go into the world, can they take with them that self-confidence, which will, in whatever sphere they end up, mean that they optimise both their own quality of life and the capabilities and qualities of people around them? Um, Peter, would you like the last word in this? Well, I was just going to say, what better memorial to Sir Ken than we should actually celebrate creativity in the city here. Brilliant. So watch this space and imagine if Bath is the city of imagination. Over to you, Penny. Thank you so much both. That's a brilliant, brilliant provocation. And uh, every child will flourish in a city of imagination. So it's my pleasure now to pass over to Marcus Davey, who's the um, CEO of the Roundhouse, and then bringing in um, our guest artists. Thank you. Thanks very much, Penny. And it's, um, oh, it's a real honor to be here tonight to celebrate such an extraordinary person who has inspired us all in so many ways, um, and me throughout my life. And just the, the words like being part of a tribe and being in the zone. And, you know, there's a whole range of phrases that are just so wonderfully Ken Robinson. Um, so I got to know Kate through, um, the wonderful Kate, through, um, I think Sally Bacon introduced us at a What Next meeting. Um, and then we kind of sat with each other quite often at What Next meetings at the Young Vic on a Wednesday morning at 8.30. And um, we just started talking and became friends. And one day I got this call from Kate said, Dad's in town. I don't think I actually knew at that time that your dad was Ken Robinson, but um, I, I didn't think I connected the two, but I soon worked it out. I'm a bit slow at some things. Um, and uh, you said uh, he'd like to come over to the Roundhouse. So we organised the trip. We walked around the studios. And for people who don't know, um, the Roundhouse is not only the large performance space where you may have seen a, a big show, but also um, 24 state-of-the-art studios making it uh, Europe's largest creative centre for young people. In the last year before COVID, we worked with seven and a half thousand young people and over 50% were from areas of multiple deprivation. Well, the tour went really well. We stopped, I think, for much longer than we expected in every studio where Ken chatted to every single person and made them laugh and they talked and they asked some very serious questions. And then Kate, Anthony, um, Ken's brother and I, piled over to Belgo across the road and had a feast um, and there was drinking and we hatched a plan. And the plan was that Ken would be, um, when he came back to, to Britain, um, we would have a formal relationship with the Roundhouse and he became our first um, associate creative curator. Um, now we're still trying to say that easily. I've been practicing that phrase for quite a long time, just say it tonight. Um, and this was about working together, building programs together, using all of Ken's brilliance and knowledge and um, fascination with creativity and imagination alongside the work that we're doing with young people. So we started doing some very small things, conversations, meetings. Um, I think they were Skypes in those days before Zoom was invented or became used to, everyone used to it. And we started to try a trial this idea that Ken would host an event with young people, of course, having art right in the center of it. And we put our first event on in January this year at the Roundhouse in our studio theater. What Kate and I didn't know at the time was that it would be his last event as well. Um, it was a really beautiful event and it was a pilot to move into the main space of the Roundhouse and to use all our other spaces. Ken is the host. It was filmed and this film will be shared at some point next year. Um, Kate and I are just looking at it at the moment. Um, the great thing is for this evening that two of the brilliant 
artists that performed were both resident artists around house, emerging artists, um, are here with me this evening. Um, so if I can first welcome Chisara, and Chisara, if I could ask you to perform first, and then I'd like to ask you a couple of questions, if that'd be okay. Yeah, of course, you can, everyone can hear me okay. Yes. And uh, this song is called Forever. <laughs> Forever, forever seems frightening Strike me with lightning, forget what I do Forever, you could destroy me If you cannot show me, the light will come through I'm just a vessel which light is passing we make bad choices, I make them too, if we don't live forever. Everyone, everyone is applauding you there, Chisara. And um, I think you summed up the emotional feeling of the event beautifully. And thank you so much for coming and joining us this evening for this um, beautifully curated RSA event. Um, so in January, um, you performed at the Roundhouse and for Ken's first hosting event, and he interviewed you. Can you remember anything? What, what did you take away from that, that event? It was, it was a really amazing evening. Um, I didn't really know what to expect. I had watched all his TED Talks and videos online and I'd written a lot of notes about the kind of uh, ideas that he had because they really hit home with me. And I think many artists can say the same once they've, um, once they've experienced that that his ideas really resonated. And I think when I met him, I was nervous. I was nervous to speak to someone, um, but he really just made me feel at home. And I think that's what everyone will tell you. I just felt completely at ease. And anything that I thought speaking to other people might feel out of place or maybe was, a, was it too big of an idea felt like, he understood completely and it was such an amazing night to just to be able to talk about um, experiences growing up and what had helped us and kind of unlocking those pathways to, to artistry and, uh, and creativity. It was really great. <laughs> I remember your interview really well because you talked about that, about how you felt connected through music and you had a wonderful um, conversation with Ken, which people will be able to see when we share the film in due course. Um, thank you very much for performing tonight and I want to ask Kate's question to you now. Imagine if. Imagine if 
people were taught that creativity wasn't just an economic exercise something to make money with but actually a force and energy a tool that can be used to transform ourselves and the world i think ken would have been applauding you at that moment that question answer that question cesara it's as always all the performances i've seen you do it was beautiful thank you very much indeed thank you so now i'd like much. to welcome boyega <laughs> boyega are you there hello bonjour Ah, oh, hello, Boyega. I can't quite see you, but I'm sure the technology will come into play in a second. There you are. Fantastic to see you again. Um, and again, you were um, there on the night in January, and um, I think you're going to perform a poem first, and then we can have a conversation. That's okay. Indeed. This poem is called Grace. I am told that my grandfather liked to travel and that wherever he went, he would write his name in big letters into the ground. Last week, someone from New Jersey contacted me claiming that they had found his name written into one of their ports. There was a general agreement as to the amount of times my grandfather wrote his name into the ground, but nobody can be certain because there are too many ports. My grandfather had seven wives and my grandmother was, amongst other things, my grandfather's first wife. When I ask, I am told that she, having failed to predict her own firstness, built herself into an anchorite made from her wedding gown and Yoruba words which all translate poorly. When I ask, I am told that many of the words that would describe my grandmother translate poorly. And so I am told that she was quiet and she died young quietly and that it just happened like that and that there was not that much to be said about it really. Cheers. Thank you very much, Boyega. Everyone's applauding. And um, I've seen you perform lots of times. I've been very fortunate to do so. Um, when we started planning the event for January, um, one of the things that Ken and I talked about quite a lot with Kate was the fact that we really wanted emerging talent, artists, young people to be at the very heart of this event and any other event that came in the future. I just wonder if you could share any reflections that you have from meeting Ken or, or from that evening. I think that one thing that struck out for me was his emphasis on the idea that there is not one set path that is suited to everyone. That us being individuals, we deserve and we should seek out paths which are individual to ourselves. Beautifully said. And that's, um, again, a great memory from that evening. And if I could, um, I wish we had more time because I'd love to go into this event, but we'll celebrate it in different ways in due course. But if I can ask you, Biega, if, um, if you could share your imagine if. Imagine if we had the agency to reject that which has rejected us. Very powerful. Thank you very much. Boyega and Chisara, um, both resident artists of the Roundhouse, wonderful poet, celebrated poet, published and musician. Um, it's been great having you pass tonight. Now, I um, kind of meditated quite a lot on this imagine if question. Um, and at the Roundhouse, uh, we have young people on our board of trustees and we have a youth advisory board. And I wondered, and I had imagined, if we could have creatives, young creatives, on every single board of every single arts organization, public organization, um, state organization, charity bodies, um, and through the lens of young people, which is about the future, decisions would be taken. What a different world we would live in today. Um, I wanted to say a big thank you to Kate um, for the introduction to Ken and for working with you, Kate. You are fantastic not only for those introducts, but in your own right. Um, and we've got to celebrate that as well because you absolutely deserve it. And my parting thing is to say, I think we're here because we know that Ken believed in the 
power, that creativity transformed lives. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you so much, Chisara and Boyega. Thank you. That was absolutely stunningly beautiful. And Ken would probably have a, a tear in his eye. But it's my pleasure now to pass over to three more wonderful people before Margaret Heffernan offers some reflections and we open up for some questions. And I know there's lots of questions we won't be able to answer immediately. But so it's my pleasure to introduce Sally Bacon, who's the executive director of the Claude Duffield Foundation, uh, Kenneth Tharp, who's an arts and cultural consultant, and Gareth Binns, who's the CEO of the Institute of Imagination. So welcome. Thank you, Penny. Um, hello, everyone. That was fantastic, Marcus, and um, uh, your young artists, absolutely extraordinary. I, as Penny said, I run the Claude Duffield Foundation in which capacity I was lucky enough to meet Ken uh, more than two decades ago now when he was putting his 99 or 1999 All Our Futures report together. And then later to meet the wonderful Kate as well and to work with her. But I'm really speaking today on behalf of the Cultural Learning Alliance, which we founded a decade ago to champion a right to arts and culture for every child. And I realize, Kate, that I'm very much this evening speaking to your point about which, which was what if we did things differently. And I want very specifically to imagine what would happen if the government reframed its stated purpose of education. In England, it's currently set out in the national curriculum, which is linked to Ofsted, which is how schools are assessed. Um, and the first aim, the first stated aim as the national curriculum is that it introduces pupils to the best that has been thought and said and helps engender an appreciation of human creativity and achievement. The phrasing, the best that's been thought and said is a direct quote from an 1869 essay by Matthew Arnold, Culture and Anarchy. And it's troubling when taken in a modern context for a number of reasons. It's passive, doesn't adequately cover all cultural forms or expressions, particularly music, dance, visual arts or creativity. And it has the potential to be used to entrench notions of class structure. The Culture Learning Alliance believes that rather than focusing on the past, there's a strong imperative for all of us working in cultural learning, in education and in government to evolve towards a more equitable landscape where education enables our children to stand on the shoulders of those who have gone before, but also to create new and exciting forms of culture themselves. In Ken's words, current systems of education were not designed to meet the challenges we now face. They were developed to meet the needs of a former age. Reform is not enough. They need to be transformed. See chapter three in Out of Our Minds. I highly recommend it. In an essay that Ken wrote for the Cultural Learning Alliance in 2014, he stated that the real basics of education are not particular subjects at all or teaching methods, but purposes. And he described four, economic, cultural, social, and personal. And said that um, learning about the arts and creativity was essential across all of them. He felt that none of these purposes could be met if we forgot that education was about living people and that many problems in education are rooted in a failure to remember this. Ken said brilliantly that the reason the assumptions underpinning our current approach to education have become so embedded is that many people are not even aware of them. They're blended into accepted everyday thinking as the way things have to be. They don't. That's an illusion as Ken always knew. Imagine if we could take those assumptions away. Imagine if we could start again on what the purpose of education could be. This year of all years, we have seen that our assumptions about life can be blown apart and that we can change how we do things. This year, teachers graded their own pupils for their public exams. No one could have imagined that a year ago. Next up, current systems of education could, could be transformed. It won't happen under this government, but there is no reason to think that a future government won't be brave enough to do it and that they won't replace Matthew Arnold's quote with one of Ken's. 
just imagine if they did. Back to you, Penny. Brilliant, just brilliant. Kenneth, over to you. Thank you so much. Um, I had the great pleasure of hearing Ken speak, uh, including at the RSA. And when, when I was chief executive of the place, I invited Ken to become a patron. And so I had really fantastic um, chances to engage with him. If you were to Google search personal qualities not measured by testing, you might well find a list from Maria Montessori, the famous Italian educator. A list that includes a whole range of attributes, 23 in fact, things such as creativity, critical thinking, resilience, curiosity, endurance, reliability, civic mindedness, self-awareness, self-discipline, empathy, courage, resourcefulness, spontaneity, humor. Please hold that thought. A group of 15 year old schoolboys are on stage somewhere in Suffolk. They're performing a dance that they've been working on for two hours a week for 10 weeks with a professional dance artist. Most of the movement they've made up themselves. There is a pause of 10 seconds between two pieces of music. One dancer, center stage, continues to move in silence but the music, but before the music joins him, except it doesn't. Another 10 seconds goes by, he's still moving and there is still no music. A panicked choreographer sitting in the audience nearly stands up and stops the performance but holds off because Throughout the weeks of rehearsal, one thing they said repeatedly to the boys was that no matter what happens on the stage, you keep going. Our dancers have now entered the stage. Eventually, after an agonizing 30 seconds, the music starts. But by now, the music and dance are so out of sync that the choreographer nearly stands up again, but stops themselves. The dance continues and soon reaches a certain point where each dancer has a phrase of eight counts in which they move downstage towards the audience, one after the other in canon. When it comes to the last boy, he completes his eight counts and then he goes on to improvise for at least another 20 seconds. It's movement we've never seen before. He ducks, he dives, he wiggles, he jumps over another boy. He ends up downstage left in exactly the right spot on stage on exactly the right note of music and things are now back in sync. The dance soon reaches its conclusion and whilst the boys are taking a standing ovation, the helpless choreographer in the audience is in cardiac arrest. There are three important things about this story. One, it's true. Two, if, all, if the boys hadn't all kept going, the piece would certainly have ground to a halt. And three, if that one boy had just obediently stuck to the script, things could still have ended very messily. Instead, he trusted his intuition in the moment and found an immediate creative response. Or as Sir Ken might have remarked, he demonstrated that creativity is a great way of breaking the rules without ending up in detention. Returning to our list of personal attributes not measured by testing, I'd like to leave you with a question, especially for any educators listening. In which school lesson could a young student demonstrate so clearly at least half of those 23 personal qualities within the short space of 30 seconds? Imagine if we lived in a world where everybody recognized that intelligence is multifaceted and that children and young people will never discover their full potential simply sitting behind a desk. Thank you. Thank you, Kenneth. That was truly beautiful. And I'm gonna pass straight over to Gareth. Thank you, Penny. Good evening, everyone. It was an honor to have Ken as a patron talk with him about imagination and creativity as its executive wing, which so elegantly articulates that relationship. For me, he summed up imagination as helping us revisit the past, enabling us to improve the present and to anticipate the future. Our own personal time machine. How precious is that? I don't think we talk about this capacity enough or set aside sufficient time for it. Talking feels to me the key enabler and engine of our imaginations. At the Institute of Imagination, we've learned from our programmes that you can provide physical space and make time and materials available but the vital ingredient is human interaction. People talking to people, sharing, telling, encouraging, listening and laughing. Talking about how they're thinking, what they're doing to shape and transform ideas into reality. Ken wrote, young children are wonderfully confident in their imaginations. Most of us lose this confidence as we grow up. I wonder when you last used your imagination and told someone about it, or when you last asked someone about their imagination. I think it's because as we grow, old, grow older, it's seen as a very personal activity, not to be shared, seen as non-productive, maybe a weakness even, as people talk of not being imaginative 
or having an overactive imagination, all negative takes. Ken had a phrase, we can use our imagination all day long and not do anything. So are we in danger of imagination being one of those capacities that if you don't use it, you lose it? What if we all talked more about imagination with each other, with our friends and family, in the same way that we ask people, how are you today? What have you been doing? It might just spark us to do something about our ideas and fire up that executive wing. The pandemic has brought the importance of this capacity to the fore, and I've not heard the word imagination used in the media as much as it is now ranging from let's reimagine everything to we're here because of a huge collective failure of imagination. Surely now it's more important than ever to make time to talk about this vital 21st century skill. One writer wrote recently, historically pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and imagine their world anew. This one is no different. It's a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. With young people, what if we can find better ways to facilitate intergenerational and cross-cultural conversations about imagination? Find mechanisms to pool imaginative ideas on particular challenges? And what if we engage the most hyper-connected communities of young people the world has ever seen in imaginative endeavors? Or are they already doing that? And is it us who needs to be engaged? And how importantly do we talk with the least connected and resourced young people? Finally, if it was young people taking the lead with the agency and tools to imagine their world anew, and what if our role is to work with them to make sure they can all find their element in that process? Thank you very much for the invitation, Kate. It's been an honour to take part this evening. Thank you, Gareth, very much. Very powerful words. And so it's my pleasure now to invite Margaret Heffernan, who's been working with our University on the concept of the city of imagination. And uh, Ma Margaret, you may know, is a well known author, entrepreneur, professor of practice at the University of Bath, but clearly devoted to this cause. So, welcome, Margaret. Thank you so much. Imagine if we weren't afraid, if we weren't afraid of each other as rivals or judges. Imagine if we weren't afraid of ourselves of all the thoughts and ideas racing around in our heads every day. Imagine if we could all say, as my daughter once said to me, you know, for the first time when people call me creative, they don't mean I'm weird and don't fit in. They mean they're excited by my ideas. I never had the fortune to know Ken Robinson, but like millions of other people, I was lucky enough to be inspired by him and felt close enough to his ideas to dare to call him Ken. We were all lucky to hear him say in such incredibly straightforward, jargon-free words what so many of us knew to be true, that we are born creative and that so much of our education and our institutional life just beats that out of us to the point where it's now possible to talk about creatives as though this was some kind of weird subspecies of humans somewhere between people and pets that have to be tolerated because it's decorative and somehow we're comforting. We have, as all the speakers today said, we have never needed creativity more. Not just because it's under threat, because it's denigrated and belittled and marginalized. Because however much we're deluged with messages telling us we're just big bundles of data. And if we just handed it over, well then technocrats could organize it and make us all tidy and predictable and programmable and efficient because we know that's not only not true, but it would be a complete denial of the best of our humanity if it could be made true. But we need creativity because we're living at a time of huge uncertainty, which means that there are huge opportunities, ideas and work to be done to craft some kind of decent future that nobody can quite see yet. We're constantly being discouraged from doing this told that what we all have to have before we can do anything is certainty, data and models, and that we can't start until we can be certain that what we're going to make is going to be perfect and profitable. But that's absurd because, of course, if we had all the data to know that what we were making was bound to be successful, then that could only be because it had already been done, in which case it wouldn't be original at all. I've spent most of my life working with 
phenomenally creative people in tech, in theater, in cinema, in television, in radio, in music. Other people think of artists as fragile, but really they're among the bravest, toughest people I have ever known. What do they do? Well, they start without any certainty. They start their work before anybody asks for it without knowing exactly what the work will be or even sometimes how it will be made. Because if you know it all before you start, why bother starting? Doing it is how you find out. The whole point is exploration. Creative work demands agency, independence, and creative people put their lives on the line every day when they start because the time invested can never be retrieved. But they do it because they can't not do it. A combination of invention and discovery propels the work, and what emerges changes the people who do it. The writer who starts a book, the dancer who starts to dance, or the architect who begins to imagine some new shape or way to do a house is not the same person who finishes it. But how the work is going to change you is impossible to know. And so it's kind of a risk not knowing. There aren't any signposts. So when we use our imagination, we change. We change ourselves and the world around us. Artists in particular frequently change before they have to, and sometimes to the rage of their fans. They know that brands are prisons. That the whole point of life is to keep looking and making and exploring and that the future may be unpredictable, but that's okay because that's where we find our freedom to shape it. All of this is true as, as true of the great writers and artists and dancers and painters and musicians as it is of engineers and scientists and painters who chronicle our time that we in a, you know so that we even if we don't understand it, we can understand more by looking at it. Ken's work and ideas are about so much more than an industry that contributes to GDP, even though it is that and that matters. For me, creativity is about meaning. It's about finding ways to understand what our experience and our knowledge and our zest for exploration all adds up to, which then, of course, keeps changing again and again. And that's how the future is made. It isn't it isn't made by technocrats to be foisted on us, but it emerges from within all of our different sensibilities, our different perspectives, our different life experiences, using the best of what we have when we're not afraid. Made by people who know that just as Chisara sang in her beautiful song, we don't have forever, so we have to create now, Ken once said that kids are creative because they take a chance when they, because they aren't frightened. Imagine if we weren't all frightened. If we, could, if we could all start before being asked to work on something we didn't quite understand yet. If we could all keep going without guarantees and when we're done, start again with the person we've now become. Because after all, that is how the future is made. Nobody knew this better than Ken, who wasn't afraid. Over to you, Penny. Wow, Margaret, thank you so much. Just a beautiful set of reflections that brought so many threads together in one. So what I'm going to do now is try and segue from that uh, and I'm going to weave a few questions and I'm gonna pass the first one back to Kate because it may lead into what you want to talk about next, Kate. So one of the questions um, is about the role teachers can play to ensure that we carry on this vital work to champion creativity. And another that links is revisiting the notion in the um, All Our Futures publication with the <coughs> um, 
1999 report for the National Advisory Committee for Creative and Cultural Education. Um, so would you like to take the baton, Kate? Yes, I'd love to. Thank you, uh, Penny, for setting me up to follow that. That's <laughs> well handled. Um, that, that was just beautiful, Margaret. Thank you. And thank you to everybody who's spoken this evening. Um, I'll answer the questions and I'll say what I was going to say. Um, in terms of the role of teachers specifically, and I'm just going to go ahead and shamelessly quote Dad on this one, he always said that if you're a teacher to the kids in your class, then you are the system. So if you change what you do, then for them, the system changes. Um, and it brings it back to the point that education is fundamentally a human system. And that as a teacher, you probably more than anybody have the power to be the change that you wish to see within the system. Um, the other thing to link to that is, as many of our speakers said, as Margaret said so beautifully, one of the very sad things about, well, for me, everything about the timing of his death was sad, but one of the very sad things for us as society about his death is that truly there has never been a more important time for his work or for his message. And in all the incredible imaginative statements that we've collected this evening, I think one thing is incredibly obvious, which is that we still have so much work to do. Um, and that work is with educators and with teachers, it's with children, young people, it's with politicians, it's with everybody. It's with everybody. Um, we often talk about education stakeholders, and I'm not sure there's anybody who doesn't fall into that category specifically. Um, so the, the thing I'd like to say about that is that he lives on um, in us. He lives on in the work that he left behind and how much there still is to do. He lives on in how we carry it forward and that this truly is just the start, that this evening's a really beautiful launch pad for the work that we all have to do to carry his work forward, many of whom, and certainly everybody here this evening, and I imagine many of whom watching this evening are already doing and have been doing right alongside him for so many years. Um, which sort of leads to the uh, all our futures um, question, which for those of you watching who don't know, it was a, it was a report that um, came out in 1999, which was commissioned by the then Labour government to look into the role of the arts in schools. I have it on my desk somewhere over there. Um, I, I, the, the report came out 20 years ago last year, and I feel, Penny, if you don't mind me saying, I feel that there is, there it is, there's Penny's holding it up. <laughs> Um, I feel there is a, a very big case to redo the report at this point. I think there are so many educators who um, have come of age at a time after the report was made. If, if you reread the, the report, which I've, I've done recently, what's terrifying about it is how relevant it still is. Um, there's, the, I'd say the only sort of, I mean, it, it, it anticipates so much of what went on to happen if it was ignored, which ultimately um, it was, you know, by, by the very people who commissioned it and by government since. but with the exception of the fact that technology is only covered in one tiny little grey box off to the side, it's um, it, it's relevant more than ever. And I, I think personally, and would love to talk about the case of, of putting together a new committee that mirrors the one that did it originally and um, doing it again. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Kate, so much for that answer. And I'm going to come to another question, and I wonder if um, Boyega and Cesara, if you would take this question, um, and it's come about come in about uh, how we ensure anti-racism and equity is woven into the imagination, provocation, and these creative spaces that uh, we inhabit. I've abbreviated that. Oh, who wants to... Is I can't see Boyega. It's Boyega. Oh, is it me then? Boyega, you're just Okay, I'll, I'll go first. <laughs> um, we say that children aren't inherently racist. Children learn to be, learn these prejudices and they learn from the environment that they're around. They watch the system and they place themselves within it. And I think if we're talking about transforming systems and showing that, that it is the people that create them, I think that we can, from an educational standpoint, see and treat others 
as equals. And especially when it comes to creativity, we think of who is allowed to be creative, who is given the time and the space to not have to worry about necessarily passing tests to get a certain job to provide for a family or to kind of then look at your children and think that I need you to be safe. Um, and that I've learned that imagination might not give you the opportunity to be safe because that's what I've been taught because it's not necessarily something that can then provide um, a meal, provide stability. And I think if we teach children that that, that isn't the case and that everyone should have access to this source of, of freedom, really, a freedom to imagine another world for yourself and therefore not relying on um, racist structures and systems in order to have uh, a leg up on someone else or to see some people as below. It all stems from seeing everyone as, as people of potential and capacity to be whatever they dream to be and that not one person or another should be. And that comes from educators and people role models and families and structures, but it starts from the idea that no one is above or below, um, which, yeah, which is something that should be learned, really, I believe. Thank you, Chisara, really, really important. And uh, Boyega, do you have a brief response before I pass back to Kate and Matthew? Sure, I think that, yes, children, of course, need to be educated. I think that adults need to educate themselves. I think that we can't put the responsibility on young people to create this transformation when we are in a position to do it ourselves and when we have the capabilities to see past our own egos and do that work. Thank you, well said. So Kate, last word. Um, well, the, the only thing left really for me to say is thank you uh, to everybody who has spoken this evening. Um, thank you to everybody who's joined us this evening to watch. Um, and just to echo again that this this is very much the beginning of a new, well, a new, a new chapter of a book I didn't want to open, but it's one that we are dedicating to doing and that I think I have every faith, and I know that he did, that we can do together. Um, and I'd, I'd also like to encourage anybody to get in touch if they've got ideas about ways to carry it forward um, with a very easy email address, which is skr at nevergrade.org. Um, but really, just thank you to Penny. Thank you so much for wonderfully hosting this evening. Thank you again to the RSA for organizing. Thank you to everybody who spoke so beautifully and, and Cesaro and Boyega for your incredible performances. Thank you. Thank you, Kate, so much. And I think from our point of view, I think I speak on behalf of the world but Ken is our hero and we will continue his creative revolution. I promise you that. So thank you. Thank you everyone and over to Matthew. Uh, look, it's been a brilliant conversation. Um, I'm very grateful to you and for everyone who um, has participated, inspiring, moving talks and performances. I also want to say thank you to the 700 people uh, who have joined this event and participated in this event. Um, I'd like to say a special thank you to you, Kate. It was a privilege and honour to have you take part in this evening's event. We're very much looking forward to the official launch of Imagine If next year and to many fruitful future collaborations. And, you know, I shouldn't speak for the RSA as a whole, but let's have this conversation about all our futures too and whether, you know, Imagine If and Bath Spa University and RSA could put something together. I just want to say one other thing. I think, you know, I know that Ken would, well, I think that Ken would be proud, moved, inspired. But you know what? I think the one thing he might say is you haven't done enough laughing. And so I just want to remind you of something that Ken said in that TED talk, which I just think is, it's just something that's never left me. When he said of academics that we have colleagues here from universities, it didn't Ken say that the problem with academics is that they think their bodies are simply things to carry their heads from one meeting to another. So let's just remember Ken's humor as well as everything else, because he was, he had a stand up comedian's timing uh, and insight. And that's one of the many things that we're going to miss. So our admiration of Ken set the bar high for a worthy tribute. And I'm confident that Ken would think that we have done him. Proud. And as everyone has said, the real work of carrying forward Ken's work 
starts now. So thank you, Penny. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all for watching. Good night.